Now, China. Well, the only time that I can ever remember in all my time at King Henry VIII, China ever being mentioned was at the end of a school dinner, and I suppose it was me, but I'm going to say it was me, left some food on the side of the plate, and a master came up and said, Jakes, think of the poor starving Chinese. And that was the only time I think China ever got mentioned in my life at the school. Now, of course, we live in very, very different times now. China is now with the United States more or less on a par, um, the most powerful country in the world. And this has happened in an extraordinary short period of time. But we in the West have got a problem about China, a very, very serious problem. And that problem is that we, all of us, everyone here, including myself for sure, have been brought up in, within a Western paradigm, a Western view of the world, a view where we genuinely have believed, and many still believe, that the West is, the world is Western. And those countries that are not yet Western in their way of being must become Western because that is the path of modernity. The assumption has been that, West, that modernity is singular, there's only one way of being modern, and that way is the Western way of being modern. Now, actually, this position has been blatantly wrong for a very long period of time because it's not China. This, first of all, happens with Japan. Anyone who knows Japan was the only country in the 19th century that was non-Western, which successfully industrialized. And anyone who knows Japan knows that it is, not, it, it is modern, but it's not Western. It's Japanese. In fact, one of the things that most appeals to me about Japan is it's always a fascinating place to go to. Now, we have to accept and learn that we live in a world of not one modernity, not singular modernity, but multiple modernities. That there are many modernities in the world. It's not just the rise of China or before that, the rise of Japan or the rise of the East Asian countries like South Korea and, and uh, Taiwan and so on. It's the rise across the world of countries that have not been part of the Western world and although they've been very influenced by the Western world, have their own histories, their own cultures, their own indigenous roots. And they bring to modernity, their own history and culture. But we find it very difficult to accept this. We find it very difficult to recognize this. How many times have you heard on the radio, today program, or whatever you listen to, or on the television, the term international community? And when you hear the expression into international community, you know what it means. It doesn't mean the world. It just means the West. Of course, it doesn't include China. Of course, it doesn't include Russia. But it doesn't include the developing world. So we still have, in my opinion, a very short-sighted view of the world. Do you know that the West, Caucasian world, if you like, accounts for only about 13 14% of the world's population? It's a sliver of the world. It's not representative of the world. So we have to learn to think about the world in a very different way to the way we think now. Now, this brings me to the question of China. We don't understand China. We don't even know how to think about China. In fact, we've been going backwards. There was a period, which I felt mildly encouraged by, between, say, let's say, the beginning of this century and 2000 and until Trump where people were curious about China. They wanted to know about it. They felt China was an opportunity. But then we suddenly went into regression. The sort of old Cold War mentality began to return to us. And we began to write off China. You know, China's communist and all this kind of thing. You know, I'm sorry, but that, if you think like that, if one thinks like that, you're never, ever going to understand China. You're never, ever going to understand China because his, 
China is a very old civilization, very different from our history and culture, absolutely fascinating, and has probably been the most remarkable civilization in human history in terms of its periods of success. So the least we owe the Chinese, a fifth of the world's population, is to understand the country, the history, and the culture. And it's no use trying to make sense of China looking at it through a Western prism. So constantly you pro we project onto China our values. Because China is not, <laughs> its history is completely different from that. that it, China will always fail that test because it's just so different. And it's not going to become like us. I mean, it's, it's learned a lot from us, of course. It's, China is a great learner, brilliant learner in this, in this modern period. But that doesn't mean it's going to become Western. It means it's going to become modern and learn from the West and other parts of the world, but especially the West in this period. But it's also going to obviously draw mainly on its own history and its own culture uh, and it, its own achievements. This is, uh, these are crude maps, but this is a map of China, the Qin Dynasty, 221 BC, when basically, after a long period of about 500 years or more, 600 years, of, of many, many Chinese states, China became uh, one. That, uh, that's uh, that's 2000, over 2,000 years ago. And then, uh, subsequent to that, um, we have the, the Han Dynasty, uh, still starting over 2,000 years ago, but lasting for 400 years. And you can see, interestingly, that already it, it, it covers a substantial part uh, of what modern China is. Modern China, this is a really crude map, but the, the, the bottom red line at the top is, 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 is the border of China today, not the top red line. And... Uh, uh, so when we're talking about uh, 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 2,000 2, years of history, uh, in some ways a rather longer period uh, than this. And China was not a country then in any uh, modern sense. It was a civilization. Um, and it grew up as a civilization. It had no, as I say, no borders. Um, and, uh, it, uh, and it was from this period that China acquired the characteristics which are crucial to understanding China. They come not from China as a nation, but China as a civilization. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about Tianxia, which is the notion of uh, 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 a very old concept in China of, of the world rather than nations. So China does have a very different view of the nations and the world, and that it carries on uh, to this day. Um, it's the period of, uh, of course, of Confucian uh, values, uh, uh, which includes concerns the value, uh, the family, uh, the notions of dif difference and relationship with the other, um, uh, notions of leadership, the importance of governance, uh, uh, were very important uh, to the Chinese view. Guanxi, Guanxi is uh, uh, essentially about relationships. Uh, the Chinese have these, which is a, a sort of central to the cement, if you like, in which uh, the Chinese social fabric uh, uh, works. Very distinctive relationship between the state and society, I shall come back to this, but very different from Western notions of the relationship between state and society. Very diff different conception of, uh, of the state. The family, very different, again, very different notion of the family uh, to uh, 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 the Western sense. Or, you know, more, um, uh, more culturally, if you like, uh, the Chinese uh, language uh, or uh, Chinese food. I mean, one of the things that holds China together is the fact that for a very, very long time it's had a common written language. So there may be, there are several dialects or different languages, but they all share uh, the, the common script. Now, these are the things that shape China. It was not until the late 19th century, when China was very weakened um, as a result of the century of humiliation and so on, that China started uh, to acquire some of the characteristics of a nation state. 
So China is partially a nation state and partially a civilization state. But to understand China, you've got to understand it first and foremost, in my view, as a civilization state, derived from its birth and shaping from over 2,000 year period. This is uh, very contrasting with the history uh, of the West, because ever since 1642 and the Peace of Westphalia, basically uh, the idea of uh, policy in the West has been based on the nation state. And the nation state is, you know, is, 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 is uh, regarded as, well, has become universal, uh, but it is essentially a Western idea. And, uh, and, and so what shaped Western societies is, is about nation state and national interests. So you have a very different history here. One is a civilizational history and one is a national history. And you can't, that's why it's so difficult to read China through a Western prism because the whole manner of its history, its evolution, its structure has been based on its civilization or civilizational uh, origins. Now, another important point about China is, is its size. Uh, I mean, as you know, it's got uh, 1.4 uh, billion people, four times the population of the United States. In fact, those four provinces have a population uh, larger than that of the United States. The next group of countries, yeah, uh, uh, these provinces are, uh, you know, uh, all these provinces are as big as or larger than any mo or most of the European uh, countries. So it's vast. The other thing just to mention to you is that uh, in a way, if you draw a line down the middle of China, uh, uh, to the right, to the east, uh, live the vast majority of Chinese. Over 90% of Chinese live to the right. To the left, uh, then uh, they're much more sparsely populated. I mean, Xinjiang, for example, which is in the news because of the Uyghur, has only got just over 1% of the Chinese population, or it's got, although it's got one-sixth of the land area. Uh, Tibet also is... Uh, uh, even more sparsely uh, populated. So now the important thing about size here, uh, the important thing about China is, um, is how, you know, you might ask the question, how the hell as a country this large survived for so long? Because historically, in a way, you could definitely regard China as an empire. How did it make a transition to being now a kind of a civilization, a nation state, and a unified country? over such a long period of history, uh, over a period of this form, uh, 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 over 2,000 years. Um, and it's interesting to observe that Europe and China moved in completely different directions over the last 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, China was divided into many states. 2,000 years ago, basically, uh, Europe was united in the Holy Roman Empire. And over the subsequent 2,000 years, what happened was that Europe fragmented into many, eventually into many different nation states, like we have today. China went in exactly the opposite direction. All the states that make up, uh, that used to make up this space called China, unified and have remained unified in all sorts of, <laughs> in varying degrees during this period, but basically unified for 2,000 years. And I think that this, if you want to understand different political values in China compared with different political values in Europe. It is that the kind of things which Europeans are concerned about, um, nation state, uh, um, democracy, freedom, and so on, very different values in China. Because China, the, for, chi for the Chinese, the importance of, uh, of the unity of China, you know, which is about the unity of Chinese civilization, the unity of that history, is the first value, the first priority. So the three things that matter to the Chinese politi politically, the three most important values are one, unity, two, order, three, stability. Now, I don't think any of those particularly would feature, by and large, usually in a European uh, priority uh, list. The other thing that's important to understand about China is, you know, because of its sheer scale, Obviously, it's extremely diverse. I mean, you know, we think, when people think about China, they think, oh, it's all in Beijing. Actually, it's not all in Beijing. In fact, there's a saying in China, um, uh, there's a saying in China, which is, um, the emperor is far away, or Beijing is far away. Because when you're living, you know, 
I mean, it's 3,000 miles across China, uh, east to west. Uh, you know, it's, very, it's a very long way away. So actually, these provinces are extremely powerful in their own right. I mean, sure, they have, they have to, you know, they, they have to follow Beijing's lead on some things, but not on other things. They're, they they can be quite different, and they have different economies and uh, 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 and so on. So it's very important, I think, to recognise the the nature, the diversity of China, um, and. Uh, and so historically, I think that, and, and today, uh, China is comfortable with diversity in a way that, by and large, the West is, and this might surpri surprise you saying this, uh, that the West is not so comfortable uh, with diversity. Um, in the sense that, um, that, that you can't run a system very, very centrally. Some things are very centralised, but a lot of it is quite decentralised and power resides in these various provinces, and they're very different. I mean, you know, if you go to Xinjiang, where I was uh, uh, several years ago, you know, it's very, very different uh, culturally to uh, other parts of China, and like, I've been most of all these provinces, and there's the, the really st uh, strong differences. I mean, that's why I think, although it proved only partially successful, or maybe in some ways not successful, but Deng Xiaoping's idea for Hong Kong was one country, two systems. You know, now, this was a, a very interesting idea of how do Hong Kong, Hong Kong become, over a period of 50 years, part of China. And so he, his idea was one country, but it operates uh, two systems. Um, now, this is a very alien idea to Western thought, because when the West thinks about a nation state, it's unified. There is only there's one country, one system. German unification, one country, one system. So Hong Kong was an attempt to find a way which, which was drawn from the lexicon, the Chinese lexicon of history, if you like, uh, about how to handle uh, uh, diversity of, of, of this kind uh, of scale. So, uh, so this is, this is, this is a, a crucial point about uh, 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 China, is China uh, as a civilization state. Now, the second point I want to make is about... Um, uh, China's, um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, the second point is about uh, what Europe and China historically had in common. I think they had something really important in common. They both regarded themselves as universal. In other words, that they were the most advanced civilizations of their time. And they were, in some ways, both thought this, a model for others. But the way they interpreted being a model for others was very different. The European notion of being a model for others was basically uh, imperial expansion and colonization of the world. And here we have a map of, for example, <laughs> all the colonies that Britain had and the date of their independence since. So the idea, that the European idea, which was most exemplified by Britain and France, was to colonise the world, to bring civilization to the world, to civilise the rest of the world uh, through uh, colonisation. So it was essentially a sort of huge geographical expansion which remade the world. I mean, you wouldn't have the United States without this. You wouldn't have Canada without this. You wouldn't have Australia. I mean, what's Australia doing in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, being predominantly white? It was a result of colonialism. So, uh, so this, was, this, this was the way in which Europe interpreted its role and mission in the world. And the world is deeply uh, marked by that, permanently marked, in my view, uh, in many respects, by that. Now, what about the Chinese? Well, the Chinese had a very, very different idea of, um, of their, their model, if you like, for the world. They thought of, the Chinese thought of themselves as the most advanced civilization in the world. The Middle Kingdom, all under heaven. They were, they could not be improved upon. So why leave China? Why go elsewhere? Why travel elsewhere when already we were 
you know, China is the place to be. So China's notion of model was a stay-at-home model, if you like, and they didn't, they didn't colonize, they didn't colonize any countries. What the Chinese had was, and it did, they did have an international system, and it was called the tribute system. Um, and uh, the tribute system was the last, longest lasting ever international system that's existed. That, it listed, I mean, probably lasted something like a thousand years, but it's well, more than a thousand years. It, in some senses, it predates even the Qin dynasty. So we're talking about two millennia in that sense. Um, and basically, this was the deal, okay? The deal was that uh, we leave you to yourselves, this is the other, the other territories and principalities and so on around in the region in, in East Asia and, and, wide, and more widely. We, we, we leave you to get on with, you know, we don't, cheat political system, rulers, that's your affair. Um, uh, all we require from you uh, is the respect, definitely. Recognize the son of heaven is the emperor of China. Recognize Confucian values is a superior philosophy or uh, philosophies. So basically, it was, a, it was a cultural system. It was a cultural system. It was not a political and military uh, system. Uh, China, during this period, if I remember correctly, only invades one country, which had a war with Vietnam in the Ming Dynasty in, in the 1500s. Um, and otherwise, it did not interfere politically with these countries and did not interfere with them uh, militarily uh, either. So, so China's view was very, very different. And an example of this is uh, this here. Um, this is uh, uh, the boat, a fleece, a fleece of boats, the big one I'm talking about, uh, the Zhenghe who was a, a Muslim, um, who sailed, uh, uh, made some very important voyages to East Africa, and uh, well, it's not known exactly how far he went, but they went very far, you can see the size of the boat. And, uh, but he traveled to East Africa, uh, Indian Ocean, across, uh, all around the region, lots of voyages in the first half of the 15th century. Uh, and what is interesting is there is, it, it left no mark. It didn't colonize anywhere came back with gifts, took gifts. It was, if you like, to show the world, the known world to them at that time, just, you know, the, the, the pride of China, uh, if you like. That was the mentality. Not a single country colonized them. The Chinese, as far as I can see, by and large, no Chinese were left there. Uh, so this, in a way, is an, an explanation of, uh, this is an illustration, rather, of what China was like, its, it, its attitude uh, of mind. Now, the, uh, does anyone know what the, the boat in the foreground is? Christopher Columbus, the Santa Maria, that little yacht is a good uh, uh, illustration of just how much more advanced China was at that time uh, than, uh, than Europe was. Although China was never really, and has never really been a maritime country. It's, it's, it regards itself essentially to be a, a land, it's got, it's, got, it's got a continental view of, its, of the world in itself rather than a maritime uh, view. So uh, that's by way of history. And I've, I, I think this is very important because you, we, we've got to understand that countries are shaped by their histories. You know, how can you make any sense of America without understanding um, the near extermination of the, Marian, of the native population. Uh, and, 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 and a, a Manichaean view of the world, of good and evil, progress and, and, uh, and backwardness. And the, you have to understand these points about China when we're trying to understand China today. Now, moving on, the rise of China. Okay, uh, in 1980, the Chinese economy was... 5% of the size of the American economy. It grew in the subsequent 35 years at about, on average, 10% a year. By 2014, 
This is the figures from the World Bank International Comparison Programme. In 2014, China, China's economy uh, overtook the American economy. Now, there are two measures of GDP. One is by uh, primary purchasing power, we'll go into the details of this, and the other is the dollar, by the dollar. And by the dollar, China is still smaller than the American economy, uh, but will, is about to overtake it in the next two or three, four years, something like that. Um, and, uh, but by 2014, it became uh, bigger. Uh, this is a good, uh, this is 2018, and uh, you can see, uh, see, we do have a light. <laughs> we have a light. Anyone misbehaves, I'll put the light on them. Uh, so here we have, look, this is 2018. There's the Chinese economy. There's the American economy. There's the Indian economy, which is now the third biggest. By, this is all GDP by primary purchasing power. Uh, there's the UK. Tiny compared with China already. I think China overtook the UK in the early, the early this century. And now, look, it's gone so far ahead. So th this is, this is, this is a, an illustration of uh, China's now, well, as it says it here, 25 percent, more than, this is 2018, tw by this measure is more than a, a quarter uh, as big a gain uh, of the American economy. This is uh, countries which have the greater trade with blue, United States, red, uh, orange, China, okay? This is in 2000, that's only 20, year, 20, year, 20 odd years ago, just over 20 years ago. Most countries are coloured blue because the United States was a more important trading partner with them than China. Now, 20 years later, most of the world is orange. In fact, the vast majority of the world is orange. China is a bigger trading partner uh, with these countries uh, than the United States. And as a percentage of the global, global total look, uh, uh, the United States was responsible for 80% uh, of uh, the global, uh, uh, global trade uh, in 2000, and it dropped about 26% uh, uh, by uh, 2020. And uh, China, as you see, has gone from very little, I don't know what that is, 15% uh, to uh, over 70%. So it's an extraordinary, extraordinary shift. Uh, the fastest shift uh, uh, in human history, the fastest economic transformation in human history, uh, extraordinary achievement uh, of China uh, in a, such a short space of time. Um, and uh, so, so this, is, this is very important because uh, we have to uh, 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 appreciate um, uh, just what's happening. You know, we're, we're blind to a lot of these things. Um, the reporting of China is very poor, by and large. It's very stilted, very frequently, but not always. Um, and, uh, and it's a long way away, um, and we're not, uh, we're not that aware of it. But, of course, we all are aware of it in some ways. We'll say, oh, look, at it, you know, because there's lots of Chinese products, and we know they're doing very well uh, in tech and so on now. Now, one of the consequences I've been talking about is the way in which China's shifted its attitude towards its relationship with the world over this period. Because... For a long time, from, uh, from 1978 when Deng Xiaoping became the key leader of China, um, the Chinese approach to the world was, you know, we're very poor, we're very weak, uh, we've seen, we need to ensure economic growth, we've got huge levels of poverty, um, we, need to, uh, we need to keep a low profile, uh, we need to not show leadership, uh, we need... Uh, American cooperation for us to become part of the international trading system, WTO, and so on. So that was a period which lasted till, let's say, well, it lasted till the financial crisis in 2008, but probably the, 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 the event that most uh, symbolizes a new shift was from Deng Xiaoping, who died, of course, quite a bit earlier, but his approach was the philosophy subsequently as well, was when Xi Jinping became the leader of China. And uh, China moved in that situation with all this new you know, strength and power and influence and so on. It moved to, a, what should we say, is a more proactive attitude in its relationship with the rest of the world. That it had been, 
it had been weak. It wasn't. It spoke with a very quiet voice. Um, it didn't show leadership. Um, it uh, it was very mod modest and very humble in the way that it handled itself. And now, you know, Xi's argument was we must ne need to move from being a, re a rule receiver to a rule maker. Because China wasn't a rule maker. I mean, the rules were made up. It was very weak. I mean, it, it, its voting power in the IMF was, didn't reflect its economic strength or anything like that. So we move then to a new era, if you like, in the way uh, China uh, saw itself uh, and uh, conducted itself. Now, uh, uh, next question. The relationship between China and the United States. Now, uh, after the revolution in 1949, um, the United States, uh, when, Mao, Mao, when Mao took power, and uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, who was previously been the leader of China, um, made, made, uh, uh, went and seized the island, or was then, then known as Formosa, now Taiwan. Um, and, uh, uh, and until 1979, it's difficult to think in these terms now, but uh, the United States recognized Taiwan as China and did not recognize uh, 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 China. And so the seat in the United Nations Security Council was held by Taiwan and not by China. Now, during the 1970s, there was a big shift in the American attitude towards China. Until uh, uh, and the, the key moment is 1972. Um, and we need to think about this because of where we are now. Because in 1972, um, I mean, I think that the United States showed great, great perception. I think China did as well, but I think, in a way, the Americans are even more uh, uh, creative at this, this moment, or, or, or courageous in some senses which is that they decided they had nothing to do, had, they had, had nothing to do with each other, um, got together in discussions, and uh, came up with a new approach, basically, which was um, that uh, they, would, they would try and establish a new kind of relationship. And in 1979, finally, under President Carter, uh, the United States recognized China as China, and Taiwan uh, was unrecognized, not recognized by the United States as an independent country. And uh, since then, very, 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 hardly any countries in the world, only some very small countries, a handful, uh, recognize Taiwan uh, rather than China. So, and this is a very, very important moment uh, because it led to a slow and steady process of gro a growing relationship between uh, the United States and China. Now, it went through many twists and turns, many ups and downs, but basically, you know, both sides hung, hung on to this relationship and it prospered. But it was based on two assumptions, increasingly based on two assumptions in a way. I mean, it was a, initially it was so obvious that it wasn't articulated, but later on it was articulated more clearly. And, the, and it was based, the, the, two, the two American assumptions about the relationship with China were firstly, it was utterly inconceivable that China would ever be able to become an economic, serious economic rival to the United States. This would, would never happen. Of course it couldn't happen. We, you know, Americans, hubristic, you know, we, are, we, we run the world. Uh, you know, look at, look at our success, look how powerful we are. You know, look how great we are in so many ways, blah, 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 blah. And secondly, which, which of course is related to that first point, the second assumption was that over time, as China modernized, it would westernize. I mean, the great assumption from the 90s onwards about modernization was modernization was synonymous with westernization. So it assumed that sooner or later, over time, it was inevitable that China would become like a western country and get, have all the characteristics and accoutrements of a western country. Now, as we know, both of these assumptions were fundamentally wrong because China did become a huge competitor of China, I mean, of, of the United States. I mean, you know, we can see this now. And uh, uh, in, in, in key areas now, uh, not in most areas, but in key areas now, 
China is on a par technologically with the United States. In other areas, it's definitely not. Uh, but given that, I mean, I think this was a shock to the West, you know, the, just the speed with which uh, this happened. Uh, I, well, I think the West woke up for its slumbers about China as well. And, th you know, th th because they'd al always been saying, oh, you know, it's sort of patronizing towards China, if you like, and, and they're thereby underestimating it. So, um, so this brings us to uh, financial crisis, 2008, huge shock, okay? Where was the crisis? Everyone had been predicting the crisis would be in China. How, how many times in that period did we hear, you know, China's development's unsustainable, there will be a crisis in China. There will be an economic crisis. It didn't happen in China, it happened in the United States. And the Western financial crisis, uh, crisis um, hugely damaged the West um, and American self-confidence. Um, and of course, China um, uh, sailed through the crisis um, largely unaffected. Um, since the financial crisis, the Chinese economy has increased by about two and a half, and the American economy has, I think, grown by about 15 to 20 percent. So the, 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 the gap has been closing and closing and closing. So uh, these, these, all these developments led to a big shift in American opinion. And in a way, this reflects it here. Uh, I can't remember what year this was taken, it's not immediately, anyway, the last 10 years, since the financial growth, I think, this is, I think this, these, these were about 2015, 2016, I think. But anyway, look, what's interesting here is the growing work concern on the part of Americans about their role in the world. So America's the gray line, and, <coughs> um, and you know, it, it's view of, its view of, uh, 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 only 21% thought it was more, in, more important than it was. 48% thought it was less important. And contrary to that, you know, China, 75% um, thought they were more important in the world, more influential compared with, and, and only 10% thought that they were less important. So, you know, this is uh, just one little measure, reflection of the growing concern uh, in the United States, which Trump gave voice to. Trump artic articulated, you know, elected in November uh, 2016, and by 2017, especially 2018, you saw a completely new American policy towards China. China, is a, China. China was no longer an opportunity, as it had been seen. China is a threat. China is a threat to American power. China is a threat to, to America's position as the global hegemon. And so you had this big shift towards... Um, you know, an increasingly hostile attitude towards uh, China. I mean, the most distasteful aspect of this, in my opinion, was uh, the attitude towards um, COVID-19. Uh, um, you know, China, if you may remember, in January, February, well, March of, that, of 2020 was damned, you know, secrecy, cover-up, blah, blah, blah. In fact, you know, I'll be quite frank with you, China's performance on COVID-19 has been absolutely brilliant. They've only, uh, only 4,700 and whatever it is people have died compared with now on the verge of a million in the United States. Um, and um, uh, now they've got some problems now, of course, uh, but th th this is, you know, th th no one's died. Um, and so anyway, the, the atmosphere became poisoned. It, there was a racial dimension to it, do you remember? Kung, fu, Kung flu. Um, um, what was the other one? Wuhan, yeah, Wuhan flu. There, there were. Uh, I mean, uh, Trump was a thinly veiled racist. Um, so, so now we have uh, the situation getting worse. What's going to happen? What's the new situation? What's the? What do I think? I think we're going to be uh, this this hostility. Um, growing hostility uh, of the US towards China, and now China's, you know, obviously hitting back, um, is going to last a long time. I can't see it lasting less than another 20 years. It, it might go on for longer than that. What are we going to see? We're going to see a growing, as we are, decoupling and separation between the two countries. I mean, these two countries are absolutely decisive in the world. They account for pushing, you know, pushing half of glo the global economy. 
Um, uh, I don't think it'll be like the Cold War in the sense that I don't think it's possible to separate them. I think the United States would actually like to separate them, actually. But it's not possible. And the reason it's not possible is this. Well, this. That's, that's why it's not possible. Because China has connections with so many countries around the world. In the Cold War, the Soviet Union existed in splendid isolation from the United States. Comic-Con and all that sort of stuff, right? So the Soviet Union is quite happy to play that game. That was, what was, that was the Soviet mentality. But China's different. China's hugely integrated with the world. If you look at continent after continent, I mean, in East Asia, China's hugely more important economically than the United States. Africa, go around the world. Middle East, it's beginning to happen as well. So China's just, you can't, they, it's impossible to uh, uh, excise China from the global economy because China is more important to the global economy, more important to more countries in the global economy than the United States is. So I think that is the limit to which that, this kind of policy uh, can be pushed. But these are very, very uncomfortable times we're living in. Very, very uncomfortable times, I think. And, um, you know, just to add, add to this point, I mean, don't you feel the world's become very unpredictable? that you don't really know what's going to happen next. That, uh, that the only predictable thing is the unpredictabil unpredictability, the uncertainty. That suddenly someone's thrown the cards up in the air and we don't know how they're going to fall. It feels like that. Why? Well, I think there's various reasons, but the most important single reason, I think, is that we are coming to the end of the US order in the world. The United States is no longer able to sustain that position like it was in the past. I mean, the, 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 it, there was no challenge for a long historical period because the United States was so important uh, uh, to the world. But now it's no longer really able to sustain that position. And the main reason is the rise of China. But it's not just China, it's the rise of the developing world as well. I'll come to, back to this. Uh, uh, and, th and that's where the majority of the world, you know, 80... 85% you know, of the world you know, live in the developing world and they're not where they were. You know, it's not just China, it's India, it's Indonesia, you know, Brazil. Lots of countries have been growing and changing the world uh, in the process. So we live in a very different kind of world. And so I don't think it's possible for one country which is weakened, which um, now represents, uh, what's its share of global GDP now? I think it's about 13, I think it's about 14% now. China's share of the global economy is now 18.2%. So China, in that sense, this is GDP by PPP figures. Um, so, so now when that starts happening, it, it's visible around the world that American power is no longer what it was. I mean. I don't want to get into Ukraine, but maybe you want me to get into Ukraine. But I don't think Putin would have done it 10 years ago. Probably. Don't think so. Um, if you're reading, I mean, reading stuff about the Middle East, the way things are shifting in the Middle East. You know, uh, the, the country, countries like uh, UAE, even Saudi Arabia and so on, now don't think they can rely on the United States. If you look at, well, Africa's long since decided that, you know, to put its lot in by, you know, it's very, has a very close relationship with China. So that's what's happening. And so as the old order breaks down, uh, the sort of things that were holding the order together, the relationships which defined it and, and, um, and, and kept it uh, uh, in a state of sort of authority and discipline, if you like, are breaking down. And so I think we should expect, the only, I think we should expect more of this. And, it's a, and we're living in, this is a dangerous period. It's a dangerous period because, you know, who's to say what is going to happen when you have a situation like this? And it'll only be really re-stabilised um, uh, when another, a new international order begins to take shape. And I think that's still quite a long way off really. You know, there is a parallel. It's not, it's not, 
It's not the same, but it's a parallel, which is what happened between about 1929 and 1945, when Britain was previously the global hegemon. But Britain could no longer do it. It didn't have the resources. It was too weak. So it joined the course from, you know, 90, well, before 1925, from about 1925. It just couldn't any longer uh, uh, play that role. But there was no replacement because at that, phase, at that stage, the United States was too internally focused to, to, to want, it didn't want to do this. It didn't want to do this. It had rejected this kind of role uh, after the end of the First World War. So you had this period of instability where the international order was breaking down, but there wasn't a replacement for it. So what you got then was balkanization, the world divided into lots of different parts, um, uh, uh, and so on. And it was only after 1945 that, that, that you got the development of the American world order and so on. And I think that, that basically uh, is, uh, is what's uh, happening now. Well, uh, now I just have to remember, just try and remember what I've got to say next. Oh, these are interesting notes. I was supposed to be saying this, was I? No. So, okay, there we are. I wanted to talk about the US and China. Um, now I want to talk about China as a global power. So what's it, what kind of global power is it going to be like? This is, in, this is the subject of my new book. Um, uh, well, first of all, um, it's going to be economically huge. Now, I think this is a slight exaggeration. I don't think it's going to happen quite as quickly as this. But in the course of the 2030s, China is likely to come to represent, account for, a third of the global economy. By the way, in 1820, China's share of the global economy was roughly a third. Uh, and the second biggest economy in 1830 was India. And you'll see India is the second largest economy here. The Chinese economy will be, will be twice the size of the American economy, or something like that, or larger than the EU, comfortably larger than the EU and the US together. Uh, now, it might not happen exactly like that, but I think these, these, are, these one way or another, are quite lightly, bro broadly speaking, quite lightly, uh, development. So I think that you can see from this that the, the, the Chinese economy is, the Chinese economy, you know, is a huge, China is the biggest trading economy in the world, i.e. combination of exports and imports. It's also, its domestic market has been growing very quickly. It's almost now on the verge of the United States. So it's hugely important for many countries in the world exporting uh, as, a, as an export market. Uh, for them. So China, what, what is going to be, what is the most characteristic form of Chinese power today? It's definitely economic. No question uh, that that is the most important uh, single uh, ex example of Chinese power. Um, that's getting ahead of myself. Um, so that's, that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is um, that uh, China has no desire to export its political system to anyone else. That is, was not true of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union wanted to, it, you know, the October Revolution, the World Revolution, blah, blah, blah. But China's completely different from that. And from what I've been saying about Chinese history, it makes total sense. Um, China has... China, China doesn't want to export its political system because it doesn't, th it, it doesn't think it's appropriate. It thinks it is so different from any other country that it would, be, it would not work. It doesn't mean that China doesn't think it can't offer insights, for example, to the developing world, of how to transition, because it has been a developing country, the most successful developing country in this era, and therefore other countries can learn a lot from China's experience. It certainly thinks that, but it does not have no desire to export its political system. And I think that's basically, you know, perhaps apart from maybe odd moments in the Mao period, that's been true historically uh, of China. Nor does China ever seek to militarily intervene in other countries. In fact, China is allergic to military intervention in other countries. If you look at the various attempts to intervene in 
the Sudan, Iraq, Syria, blah, 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 blah. Usually China's opposed it in the Security Council uh, uh, of the United Nations. It doesn't think that is the way to solve problems because China's commitment, by and large, its belief system, is that that's counterproductive because when you, you could create more problems by military inter intervening militarily in the longer run uh, than by finding a solution which is indigenous to the situation and the region in which it exists. So China's got a very, very different attitude for the, to the United States. I mean, the United States is a country that does believe in exporting uh, its system, the American Constitution, you know, every country should be democratic like we are in our, in our particular kind of form, etc. And it does believe in military intervention, as we all know, Iraq, and Afghanistan, and so on, but countless examples uh, since uh, 1945. Now also, I mean, you know, one of the fatal errors that the Soviet Union made of many was to militarily try and compete with the United States. I mean, you know, the, the Soviet economy was never more than half, at its most, never more than half the size of the American economy. It was just a crazy strategy. Um, now, China, well, it's true, th sorry, this, I need to update this, but anyway, it, uh, it, it's still roughly, this, roughly proportioned like this. China spends a third of the amount on military expenditure as the United States. Um, and uh, of course, it has modernized its military capacity, definitely, uh, a lot. Uh, but it's not, you know, it's not a big military spender. It's got arguably one base, I don't know whether military installation or base, uh, Djibouti, uh, which uh, uh, is where the, run by the Navy, Chinese Navy. Uh, for its anti-piracy anti -piracy operations, the international operations in the uh, Indian Ocean. But it doesn't have bases. And I don't think we should assume that China's going to have military bases all over the world, like the United States has. I just don't think that's the way the Chinese think. You know, uh, Ch Chinese just doesn't have that, that history. I'm not saying it won't do more of it, but the idea that it will do anything like the United States has as a global power, I think, uh, would be, uh, is wrong. Now... The key to understanding China's uh, diplomatic um, priorities is its relationship with the developing world. That is the key to understanding China. Economically, its trade with the United States and Europe is more important than its trade with the developing world, but it has an intimacy with the developing world that it does certainly not. It certainly doesn't have uh, with the Western world, and the importance of this is captured in this pie chart, because in this is the at the moment uh, the developing world accounts for about 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 57, 58 percent of global GDP. And the projection here is that it'll be about two-thirds, one-third. In the 1970s, it was the opposite. The developed world, the rich world, the rest, Western world <coughs> and Japan accounted for two-thirds of global GDP and uh, the developing world only accounted for one-third. So this is the great change. What is the great change in the world? It's not just the rise of China. It is the rise of the developing world. There's no, absolutely no question. So the future is fundamentally is, uh, is, in, is in the developing world. And chi China has put, you know, the China's uh, relationship with Africa is close relationship with Africa. Um, the kind of, uh, you know, uh, example it tries to see. I mean, if you want to understand why Africa's grown much quicker over the last decade than previously, basically it's because it's relationship with China, trading relationship with China. Um, and the key initiative in this context has been Belt and Road. Um, now, I think you probably all know something about it, but Belt and Road is, you know, China's, the, the ambition is to transform the Eurasian landmass where 65% of the world's population lives um, by basically transforming the infrastructure of these countries. Um, and 
China's uh, thinking about this, I think, which is already alluded to, it is, look, we're a developing country. This is how we did it. We, you can't do it exactly like we've done it, but this is how we've done it. We've done it basically by upfront investment in infrastructure, uh, state-led, but open market, op open markets, no, you know, no, don't put up trade barriers, etc. And And it's worked... You know, it's worked for us, and it can work for you. That's, I think, the Chinese message. And uh, there's a huge number of countries now uh, involved in this extraordinary venture, which I think, you know, it's been going since 2013 was the fir was first announced. Uh, huge amounts of money have already been invested by China in it. It's, a, it's essentially a bilateral it's, it's, uh, endeavour. China plus another country, China plus this country. So it's, it, that, that's the basis on which it's done. Um, and uh, Europe is partially involved, especially Southern Europe and parts of East and Central Europe are involved, in, including the Ukraine. And, um, and so there, there is, there, there, there's a you know, fantastic example of uh, China's, uh, China's view of the developing world. The United States is against it uh, um, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and makes very, uh, denounces it. Um, but, you know, that the Americans are talking about having their own version, but it, it'll be too late. It'll be m more than 10 years too late. They don't have the funds to do it. They don't have the interest. I mean, here's a big difference with the, between China and the Western world. You see, China, has, China feels it has an affinity with the developing world because of where it came from. I mean, in, 19, um, in, in, 19, in the 1950s, China was one of the poorest countries in the world. It was poorer than a lot of African countries. So it had to drag itself up from its bootstraps. It knows what it means. Knows it knows what it means to be poor. It knows how important economic development is. This is why China says, "Look, if you're a developing country, first of all, economic development, not political development, not democracy, and those kind of things." I agree with the Chinese about this. I think you know. If you're a very poor country, you've got to find a way of feeding people. You've got to find a way of being able to educate people. You've got to be able to find to, to, to provide a minimal health service. These are the priorities of people in poor countries. Of course, they can choose politically wherever they want to go. But, I mean, uh, China's emphasis on this is absolutely right, historically, in, in, in my view. So, so this is... Now, the problem with the West, in my view, in its relationship with the develop, developing world is summed up by they're not part of the international community. I mean, they st the Western view, our view of the developing world is still, you know, it's a sidebar. It's secondary. It's not a key player in the world. We look down on it. The political systems leave something to be desired. There's too much corruption. It's, a, it's, a, it's negativity, negativity. And of course, we... we we look down on poverty. We, let's face it, we look down on poverty in countries that are poor. And the Chinese have a diff very different mentality because of where they've come from. So they identify <coughs> with it in a very different kind of way. OK, well, I think, I, I've, I think I've more or less finished now. But um, Oh, yeah, no, I haven't quite yet. <laughs> you won't get away that easily. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just entering my third hour now. Now, this is a brilliant map. Thanks to Danny Kwa, formerly of LSE, uh, now at the Dean of the School of uh, Lee Kuan Yew School in Singapore. Now, Danny, uh, a few years ago, put together this absolutely fascinating map. And I'm going to leave you with this map. And he wanted to try and work out where the center of gravity of the global economy was. Where is the center of gravity of the global economy? And in 1980, he placed it here, okay? Which makes sense because at that point, the global economy was still essentially a North Atlantic economy, right? Then he plots the movement of the center of gravity moving steadily eastwards. And now it's about there. And 2050, he thinks it'll be about here. 
that is on the border of China and India. Now just think about that. Because all, we've been brought up, up, our parents are brought up, our grandparents are brought up, our grand-grandparents have been brought up. So, so long, for 200 years, the West is the centre of the global economy. The North Atlantic, it's a North Atlantic economy. And all these other countries, I mean, my wife was Malaysian, and so when I was really struck, uh, when I first met her, you know, that her friends, they travel to London. They travel maybe to Europe. They might go to the States or Canada or Australia. They didn't travel, they didn't travel in, 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 you know, in this part of the world. That's Malaysia there. It's not a very good map of, Malaysia, of uh, Southeast Asia. But no way. So, and that's changing. That's changing because what's happened is now they travel here. The connections are more and more here. So increasingly, you know, the world, of course, Talking about trade with China, blah, 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 how important it is. So the lines, that, that if, if, if it was a magnetic field, you'd see that this was the new, uh, uh, um, the new pole of attraction, this area here. And we are on the outside looking in. And that is the world that our uh, kids or, you know, the next 100 years, that's what the world will be like. And we've got to learn to live in it. And this nonsense about saying, well, you know, just condemning it, just dismissing it, which is the new norm amongst too many, um, too many political figures and so on, is just so unbelievably short-sighted. Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, this is nihilism. Because this is happening, it's been happening now since 1980, and it's going to continue happening, and we need to find our place in the world. The world is no longer Western. Thank you.